Welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today we have the fabulous Craig Schultz. Uh, Craig Schultz is an entrepreneur, author, speaker, an investor who has been in business for over 20 years and built business into a hundred different countries. That's, that's unbelievable, Craig. He is passionate about inspiring people to live their life with passion and purpose. Craig is the author of You've Got One Shot, a personal heart-wrenching story of how Craig and his wife lost their baby, Ethan, before birth. His hope is that his story will inspire you to live an extraordinary life with purpose and passion. Welcome, Craig. Thank you for having me on the show. Really looking forward to uh, sharing some insights with your audience. Brilliant. So before we start, what about just a bit of an elevate, elevator pitch on you and what you do? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, I've... Um... You know, I, I left home when I was 15, fired my boss when I was 21 to follow my dreams and passion, uh, set up five fitness clubs, uh, then uh, 22 franchises. Then I built an online business into 100 countries. Um, and I'm an investor. I probably made most of my wealth through in property investing, uh, but I am an investor in a couple of private companies as well. And um, I teach people now how to become a market leader in their niche. Uh, probably a content creator at the moment as well. So really passionate about education and inspiration to help people live their life with passion and purpose. Hence the book, you've got one shot, go out there and give it your best shot. Yeah, love it, love it. And your book, you've got one shot, I've got it here, right here with me. <laughs> and I've highlighted bits in the book and I've got some passages that I'd like to, to uh, highlight to the listeners today. Uh, can you tell the audience what your book is about? Sure. Look, I mean, for me, um, as an entrepreneur, I, I was involved in a coaching program and they used to always say, Craig, Craig, we'd love you to write a book for your personal brand. And I always said to me, I, I will only write a book. I don't just want to be another business person with another business book. I want to write something that has impact and yeah. deep and meaningful. And my wife and I in 2014, we went through a challenging experience of um, having a stillborn baby and that was a situation which uh, was life-changing like I say that I grew up more in one week than I had in 34 years yeah. and um, I brought that book to life because in the funeral I said my son hasn't had one breath on this planet you're all in the game so what have you got to worry about so the, yeah. the story is around you've got one shot because you've got one shot at life and it's a story of a stolen heartbeat and what that taught me about living a meaningful life. Yeah. And I love this saying, I wrote it down uh, in, that's in the book. It said, Ethan didn't die. He just didn't live. Mm. And I just, I love that really spoke to me. Uh, and some of the viewers might know or may not know that I lost, uh, I had a stillborn as well many, many years ago. Uh, and I went through those challenges uh, that you and your wife, Karen, went through. And it was really interesting for me to see the father's perspective. Mm. And it highlighted for me that maybe I didn't even think of that. Mm. You know, and, and I'm talking, this is you know, 24 years ago, Craig, mm. that I was thinking, I, I actually, I was so absorbed in grief mm. that I couldn't see outside of myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, look, I mean, and um, uh, when you shared that with me, it, uh, yeah, it, oh, when I talk to people about that situation and people that have been through it, you sort of have this connection because you're sort of, you know, going through that experience and you've gone through it in a totally different way. But my wife, if I was to describe her as this really empathetic, loving person, but I sort of felt she was the strongest of the two at the initial part. Like, you know, I'd never cried to her in my entire life. I was very closed book. I will deal with challenge and adversity for our life. And going through being told that, you know, you, there's no heartbeat here. And I'm like, going, I just want this to go away. I want Karen yeah. to go into theater and I don't want her to know what's going to happen. They said, yeah. well, no, she'll have to deliver the baby. Now I yeah. cried for hours on end and it was the first time I cried in front of her, but she was this 
just felt so strong and stoic as she was dealing with having to go through the excruciating pain yeah. and the experience. And yeah, I think both parties go through the experience in two totally different ways. Yeah. And I completely related when I read that in your book about, I just wanted to like go away and like, do you really have to give birth to the baby? Like, you know, then that, and I went through that whole process too. It was like, because you know, I'd never done it before. It had, you know, I have never experienced it before. I just thought that you, you know, you wouldn't have to do that. Mm. Um, and so it really, you know, and all the different processes, I suppose, that people maybe don't think of mm. unless you've been through an experience like this, mm. is for me, I remember I'm sure you know you had the bed, the the nursery ready, mm. the clothes in the, you know, the little cupboards the you know people were from even you go to the milk bar people know that you're having a baby so and when you go out to the world they don't know and so then you've got to face it every day uh and I know you know from Karen's perspective she would have gone out and people may have said to her oh you've had the baby mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, that there was certainly one thing. Like, we were packed, our bags were packed to go away on a holiday together to just, you know, spend some time together in the lead up to the delivery because everything had been, every checkup all along the way past 30 weeks was all looking tremendously well. And that was just a routine checkup on the way to our holiday. So our bags were packed for a holiday. And yeah. uh, three days later, you're leaving a hospital and you're going, well, what's just happened here? <laughs> like we're signing birth certificates, death certificates. We're mm -hmm. going into grief counselling. We've spent two weeks with our child that's in hospital with us. It's not going to leave. Like it was, it yeah. was what I describe as an out of body experience, mm -hmm. you know, totally, totally random and yeah I wouldn't wish it, anyone to go through it yeah what what's the biggest learning that you got out of this whole experience my biggest learning is a hundred percent was I took life too much for guarantees you know so for me I was doing well in business doing well financially doing well had a loving relationship I had beautiful yeah, I'd seen my all my siblings had beautiful kids. I had these nephews and that, and all my friends were starting to have kids. So I just sort of like took every stage of life through buying a house, you buying investments, you know. Now we're married, now we're having kids. And yeah. I think if I was going to be a father in that situation, I probably would have just continued to take life for granted. And the biggest lesson mm -hmm. out of it was, whoa, things can happen pretty quickly here. And now I feel that I have a lot more deep and meaningful connection with my kids and yeah. you know, really, really in the moment conversations with them and, and have a real, you know, like a, a, a totally different approach to how I want them to experience what this world has to offer. So I think that there would be hundred percent, the biggest lesson learned how to go in through that experience. It's a bit like I say to people when I'm coaching them, that the, if you get to the, uh, the rocking chair at the end of life with regrets, you know, you can't fix that situation. When you've had your life flashed in front of your eyes, it may be a car accident, it may be a health issue, it may be going through that where you're like, oh, well, that's that's the punch in the face that, uh, or the invisible hand that goes, okay, you have to go to 120 different cities. You have to take your kids around the world. You have to fulfill your dreams and passion. There's no other option. Yeah. And that's what I take out of it. Yeah, brilliant. And has it, did it change the relationship with your wife, Karen, at all? Yeah, totally. Like I went through um, a solidarity type of phase where I wanted to go and do things together. So for, because we had, um, you know, a few mishaps in the lead up to even Ethan. So my wife was technically, before we had Zach, uh, she was pregnant pretty much for three years non nonstop. Like she would go through the healing process. We'd get pregnant again straight away. We'd go through, you know, it, was, yeah. it was quite a, you know, tor uh, it tormented your brain. You're going, am I ever going to be a parent? Um, yeah. But we did things together. We did cooking classes. We started doing yoga together. I lasted about a month at that, but she does it every <laughs> week now, like four years later. And that was something that I introduced her to. And she's like, 
deeply, you know, thankful because she's fell in love with something like that. And, um, you know, was, she went through a, what I would call the Western model of, you know, utilizing all the services at hand, like the grieving, uh, they had mother's groups for people in that situation, the counseling opportunities. And I went through a bit more of an, a spiritual type of awakening of like searching for answers and, you know, connection down that. So it's sort of, sort of taken two different pathways there, but both supported each other's decision to go down that laneway. Yeah, beautiful. And, and when did you decide I'm going to, I'm going to write this book about it? It was four years. Oh, look, I actually would say I was journaling uh, the the time between leaving the hospital and uh, the funeral. I was at such a empowered place of this message will be shared to the world. He'll he'll leave his footprint and his legacy through a message. And, you know, as an entrepreneur and a business person that has the skills to do that, I've spoken in stadiums of 15,000 people before. And, you know, I knew that I could deliver it. I knew I could do the work. Now, time means everything. And for me, it wasn't the right time to write the book. So I was just always writing journal notes and journal notes and journal notes. And it was four years later. So it was like, I'm in a really good place to do this now. And it took me about 18 months to put together. It is my life's work. It wasn't just to write a book to say I've written a book or anything. It was, you know, taking the time. It was lots of reviews. It was engaging a team of people like um, publisher that could, you know, like review the book and help with a manuscript and, um, uh, bounce ideas off and you know what about this what about this there's some really yeah. great touches and, and it's sort of all manifested to be honest like in my book I write a letter um, and I've put the letters every second chapter yeah. in the book but I was writing those letters and the time that I shared it to the world like that was happening on his birthday every year yeah. And as I put them together, I'm going, wow, this is sort of like it was meant to be written at this point of yeah. time in the book. So, yeah, it's amazing how the world works. And um, I think timing's everything for everything. So yeah. uh, I didn't rush into it um, when I had the time to do it. It was, you know, I feel that I'm really deeply passionate that, you know, I had a lady last week that I met in a medical clinic and I just had the book there and she read the book and she walks up to me, gives me a hug. I'd never met the lady before while she was there reading the book and then she's evangelizing the book. And then she sent me mm -hmm. a book last Friday and said, I want to buy 10 books off you. Cause I just think I need to give this to people. And yeah. you know, I didn't go out to do the whole, the gaming of getting a bestseller or anything. I just think if, if it's good work, it will just uh, serve its purpose. Absolutely. And, the process of writing the book, and I know you, you wrote the letters regardless, but then putting it all together, was that, was that a healing process for you? Was it, was it a scary process for you? Like, how did you feel? What, what sort of emotions did you go through when, and, you know, launching the book? Yeah, look, that was one of the things. So when I do anything and why I coach people to become market leaders, I always, and whether it's investing or, or anything, I always want to engage people that can guide me. And that's sort of like one of the important things. So um, I had a, a coach that I was working with at, um, you know, an education company. And he said, look, I want to put you in touch with this person that does this for a living. And I just had a conversation with her and she sort of like knew of who I was, but we'd never spoken before. And she said, when you showed me that Facebook post, I remember that story straight away it was when I shared it to the world. And she yeah. said, if you write that book, you will just do something very different because it's coming from a male, it's yeah. someone being completely and utterly vulnerable at your space. You know, there's, you know, it's sort of like, it's a bit of a, a unicorn in the book world in its own sort of angle that we would take with it. And I just knew at that time that we connected and I said, I want to engage you to guide the process. And so I, I was out of comfort zone, um, but I sort of felt I had, you know, someone that could really, you know, give me the, the good pointers. So I wasn't like flying blind. Yeah. And your book is 
is so much more than the story of the event of losing uh, Ethan. It's also about empowerment, mm. you know, afterwards. So there, there are definitely moments that, uh, you know, that I got emotional reading uh, the book. But then there's a lot of empower. Most of it is empowerment. I yeah. saw um, from the coaching that you do. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, lessons in life uh, are often learnt. And over my 20 years in business, I've probably invested a half a million dollars into working with some of you know my favourite entrepreneurs in the world and mentors and masterminds. And I've just continued to invest in myself and grow. And, and apart from having the knowledge, I've put all the knowledge into practice as well. So I sort of feel like I have a really good uh, ability to know what I'm doing in business and everything. And there's, there's life lessons that I feel that are so important. And I elaborate on how important is gratitude and generosity. And I share a story about how I found my first mentor through generosity and gratitude. And then I share the importance of leverage as a concept and leverage for me is how I've built wealth but how do you leverage time money and develop meaningful relationships to open opportunities so I share stories about that so I try and story tell to bring the importance of you know ego for example is another example in the book where ego can be your best friend or your worst enemy it just depends if you have the self-awareness yeah and what about perspective like perspective in life is everything so you know and I share stories around these concepts that I believe he will stop dreaming because of challenges in life and what's yeah. important to keeping the dream alive. So that's sort of the empowerment side of the book that can really help people get a, you know, get some concepts and uh, apply it to their life. And I think, and I think for me anyway, there's, I've always thought there's defining moments in my life that, and most of them, you know, I've, had, I've had some tragedies in my life uh, and some other defining moments that may not have been great at the time, but at the same time, I've learned so much from them. And these defining moments have changed me. And I think it's about the time that we're living in right now in business. Mm. And there's so much fear around. Mm. And so, you know, I look at your book and it's even though people may not have gone through the, the experience that you've gone through and what Karen went through, there's a lot of business strategies in your book mm. and, and dealing with fear in the environment right now. There's a couple of things, actually. I, 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 I highlighted them in the book mm. that I wanted to read because I thought they were great. You said, you are not your thoughts and you don't have to believe every thought as truth. A thought is a sensation and is not permanent. If a strong breeze comes out of nowhere and you experience a slight chill, you can see it for what it is, a fleeting sensation. And I, and I look, read that and I thought, that is just perfect for this timing mm. with all the challenges that people are going through in business. Uh, and then I, I, there's a couple more I have to read. Yeah, I, I love your book, Craig. Uh, and then you, you wrote, if there's such a thing as the good kind of imagination, then there's such thing as the bad kind and I think that again that's really fitting because in business you know I always say that there's the event and then there's the story that we create around the event mm. right and so I feel that there's lots of opportunities in business right now mm. even though it's really challenging time and so I read that and I thought that is just fitting for the moment mm. uh, and then you also said remember fear actually destroys dreams and you're going to say, if you really want to design the life of your dreams, don't lose that Superman cape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mine's a Superwoman cape. <laughs> and I yeah. love that. Uh, and I, uh, uh, that there is, you know, fear does uh, cost people their dreams and people stop dreaming. Like when you're a child, like my kids now are three and six and they do feel they can jump off buildings and they live, they don't understand what's happening in the world. And then you, you know, you go through university or school and get a good education. You then get into decks, you buy a house and then you get a job and it's trying to climb the corporate ladder. And then yeah. it's challenges around that. And then it's like, well, I'm financially challenged and, and people lose that hope in life and yeah. dream and you know then you overarch things that are out of your control like what we're currently living in now and then you get put into a sustained 
um, constant level of fear and, and then it's, you know, just a perpetuating um, situation and, you know, 20 yeah. months of what we've been through. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people in a lot of really challenging situations and, you know, I sort of said to someone, 90 days into my book I said look my message now is probably more important than any time in yeah. life um so yeah hopefully people grab the book as well and yeah take the lessons absolutely what would be your message for the people that are are challenged at the moment in business uh look I think every situation is going to be very different um yeah because it's quite easy for me to say, you know, everything's going to be okay. It'll all work out. And that's just a cliche that's thrown around, but some things are literally taken out of your control. So yeah. spending a lot of time in the fitness industry, um, if you're locked down and you've got a physical business for 10 months, you know, yeah. ah, yeah, you can go online, but you know, who are you competing against? Everyone. And, you know, yeah. if you don't have those skills to go online, it's an easy thing to say, not necessarily an easy thing to do. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, look, I just really, there's so much negativity out there. I, I spend probably two to three hours a day listening to things that will uplift me, listening, yeah. developing new skills, listening to podcasts, having conversations with people that are not going to take you down, but lift you up, trying to collaborate and network with people that can potentially help each other out, you know, so the local restaurant or the local hairdresser may be able to collaborate with the local gym owner and you might be able to, you know, cross promote and help each other out. It's a time yeah. to be what I describe as business alchemy and business alchemy is creating something out of nothing. And if you can yeah. do that, you know, navigating your way through will be challenging. Some businesses are in high growth at the moment. You know, if you own yeah. home gym equipment business and, you know, good on you. If you're an online alcohol um, distributor, you know, you're going through high growth at the moment. So everyone's going to have their differences. And some people are, you know, are in really dire situation and it's, you know, lockdown is going to make it worse. Yeah. And I think what you, you know, what you touched on was, you know, there are, is stuff that's out of your control. So we can't, you know, if we focus what's within, because we've always got something that's within our control. And I think definitely that my, our mindset is within our control. If we can fill it, as she said, with really empowering stuff uh, and have that strategy. In regards to health, what, as an entrepreneur and uh, a successful businessman, how do you, how do you look after your health? What's important to you? Do you have any habits that, daily habits? Have daily habits for me i um i uh, well i spent 15 years as a personal trainer and i was okay. semi-professional athlete as well playing you know a few sports at a pretty competitive level so i've always had that as a high priority high value of yeah. you know 45 minutes to an hour of exercise and you know the things that go around that which is drinking lots of water and trying to eat as good as I possibly can so that those type of things are just like non-negotiables for me no matter what but yeah. I am um, going through the process of of um you know what I went through and I said I went on a bit of a spiritual journey I started to learn a little bit about uh, meditation then and I went through probably three years where I meditated for at least 15 minutes every single day and I felt incredible from it and yeah. probably over the last three years I have used it with um, sparingly when I felt that I've needed to dig into it rather than a habit so if you have yeah. never tried the mindfulness approach to dealing with stress and so on I think that's a really really good thing to latch on to I know there's a lot of apps out there for beginners and so on I learned through being a part of a, a group um, in spiritual healing um, and journaling like taking things from up at here onto paper I think if you write stuff down you can really um, you know it can be quite beneficial for you but you know mindset you mentioned that I'm big 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 on li listening to content 
that yeah. puts me in a really good frame of mind. And I think those sort of extras around that physical side of things is pretty important. Yeah. What are the biggest mistakes that you see new business owners or entrepreneurs make at the moment? Um, biggest mistakes, if they're new, is sometimes people get into business because they sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And getting into business is a good idea, um, you know, and they're usually getting into business because they want to control their financial future. And some people get into business because there might be a good opportunity at the right time or the right place. And, you know, it might be, oh, I'm leaving this con uh, contract position here and I'm actually now going to be a private contractor with yeah. the contract. And you sort of like walk into a business. But, yeah. you know, if you go, hey, I just want to open a cafe or a restaurant and you've never had any business skills before and you just yeah. think it's a good idea, you know, you go into business to build financial freedom or time freedom. And then um, you end up getting buried in legal agreements, finance agreements, operations, delivering the product and service. So I, I call it the master chef syndrome. And the master yeah. chef syndrome is everyone that comes through master chef is deeply passionate about being a chef. And then yep. they go out and start their own business. And what happens is they're stuck behind their cooking, which is what they love doing, but then yep. they're running a business and that there buries them because they don't have the skills to build a business. So I would say to anyone that's going down that laneway is to potentially get a coach or join a mastermind or, or, or get some, some sort of mentor or advisor that you can really lean into to uh, help you navigate through the challenges that you're inevitably going to be going through. Yeah, yeah, great advice. And what about what would be your advice for? There's so many, and I, I coach lots of coaches, and I can tell you, nearly all of them will say, "Oh, one day I want to write a book." Hmm. What would be your your uh, I suppose tips on writing a book? Mm, yeah, look, I think. Um... I'm a big journaler, so I like to, like I've got bits of paper all over here at the moment. So just to give you an idea, um, I've got an exercise book and here's all notes. So all my ideas I take out of my head and I put down on paper. And you physically write it down. Yeah. Physically writing stuff all the time. And um, so I like to be, you know, planning um and preparation is the best thing when opportunity can arise. So, you know, yeah, developing skills and so on. But I helped a lady the other day. She's looking to go into business for her first time. And one of the things that she did was she went and spoke to a handful of people nearly as a mastermind type of approach where she could bounce her ideas off and trigger for new ideas. Now, when I yeah. started my first fitness club, you know, 20 years ago, I did that. I went out there and I went to all these different people in the industry and I said, this is what I'm looking to do. Do you think, what would you do in that situation? So if you are looking to write a book, you could apply that as similar type of process is, hey, let me go and bounce my ideas off X, Y, Z person, or, you know, I want to just brain dump all the information and then, you know, I want to try and put together a manuscript um, rather than just writing it by just saying, hey, chapter one should be about this. Chapter two should be about this. Chapter three should be about this. And yeah, yeah planning and preparation, I think is really, really important. Yeah, brilliant. So you've done lots of, lots of things in your business from uh, health and fitness and, um, and property. What, what's been your biggest challenge? Biggest challenge was the global financial crisis. Uh, yeah. My first six years in business was a bit of a dream run. In a way, I was basically turning up to a bank saying, hey, I've made all this money. I'm in my 20s. I've made all this money. I want to buy a property. And, you know, yeah. in 2001, which I'd never been through a GFC or a global financial crisis in my life, to 2008, yeah. I'm like, oh, this game's too easy like that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in the space of 18 months, Bank said, hey, Craig, we won't lend your potential franchisees the 
with five hundred thousand dollars that they need to start the business. So I couldn't sell franchises. Wow. Then it's like, oh, I've just signed two leases. Now you're a, a self-employed person. We're not going to lend money in a global financial crisis unsecured for these uh, fit outs that you need. And yeah. I had to draw upon my own uh, property investing, which I was doing quite well in at the time as well. And I just made it through. Like the US dollar yeah. changed and I couldn't get, my equipment went up $100,000 overnight. And then as we're living now, all my clients say, I love you, Craig, but I'm worried about my own financial uh, situation. And, you know, so I went for about 18 months where I was, my wife uh, was making a salad and I would get a 60 cent bread roll uh, from the mm -hmm. bakery around the corner. And I just had enough to get through. Like one more thing could have sent me under. So yeah. the challenge of that was me getting up at 10 to five every morning at home at eight o'clock every night and just grinding it out. I was exhausted. Yeah. I, but I always said to myself through mindset, it's not a matter of if I'm going to get through this, it's when I get through this, I'll put myself yeah. into a position that I'll never be in this situation again. And if I didn't take that approach, imagine still having five gyms and 22 franchise and expand over the last 10 years, I would have went bankrupt last year. So yeah. it's always the evolution of, you know, what, what can I do to recession proof myself, risk management, look at my downside of the things that people need to do. It's not going to yeah. be summer all, all the time. It's going to be a, an autumn, a spring and a winter too. Yeah. And particularly, sometimes you might think that you've thought out all the options. Yes, if this happened, the worst happened, but I suppose the last more than nearly two years now mm. in with COVID we've been going through stuff that I did not in any way ever think would ever happen in Australia mm. um, so it's it's for me from as a business owner it was very much about I, I said to myself I'm so fortunate that I've got my coaching skills mm. because to embrace that uncertainty you know, as a entrepreneur, a business owner, there's all it's uncertainty everywhere, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and flexing. Mm. Uh, I know people that what was the big word pivot? Yeah, uh, there's been so many catchphrases in the last you know uh, over a year. But pivoting, you know, I was pivoting my business. I'm continuing to pivot my business, um, yeah. and to embrace that new opportunity. Okay, so that doesn't work. Let's move this. <laughs> um, you know, my my business is live events. So we'd have one live event and it was like, okay, can't do that this month. Okay, let's move that. Let's do something different. Um, how, what sort of tips would you give people to, to continue? Because we've still got uncertainty. Oh. Um, yeah. Again, I'll, I'll go back to everyone's, everyone does have to be agile in their business because uh, at the January 21, let me rewind my last international trip. I went to 16 countries, October, 2019. I toured through Russia, Lebanon, Africa. Um, my business was going incredibly well. I, I finished with a, an entrepreneur retreat, November, 2019 and took the rest of the year off. And it was sort of like, wow, like, look what I've accomplished. I'm making incredible money. Things was going amazingly well. And I was mapped out and planned for January to do, go to China in February, India in March, Philippines in March, Europe in April all paid for, all ready to go and bang, everything yeah. stopped. So I did, uh, I've been able to manage my way through um, that situation and through doing a lot more online things, but some businesses are not going to be able to just do that. Like that's yeah. not an option for some businesses. Um, so, you know, I get, come back to being that you know, business alchemy, business alchemy creates something of nothing. Who can I joint venture with? What um, assets can I develop now while I'm handicapped uh, to be able to leverage moving forward? So last year, I interviewed over 100 of the biggest entrepreneurs in the world for my podcast. Um, I launched my book. I co-contributed to another book. Um, yeah. So I started developing these assets 
to be able to redeploy and create that sort of content machine where people are now con continually connected to me. I didn't have that in my plan in January last year. I just yeah. evolved to be that. So yeah, business alchemy, um, uh, yeah, really working on yourself and look for opportunities. That whole, how can I co-collaborate? Like a good friend of mine, Michael Lane, was an events yeah. business success resources and he was doing 500 live events a year mm -hmm. to having to move into doing a lot of online stuff. And, you know, every business is impacted, but you just have to try and navigate your way through. Yeah, absolutely. Reach out. Like one thing I say to people in people are really empathetic now, like people in my Facebook group, um, even though I do coach people, I just say, hey, if you need to really, if you're stuck, just call me. Like I'm not going to charge anyone for anything if they're really, I, I want to help people. So uh, it will just, uh, you know, what goes around does come around. So if I can help someone in, in their business by giving my time, which I've done many, many times, including that lady last week, um, it will come back, you know, when they've got a big business, I'll say, you know what, Craig, that advice you gave me then, you know, change the way I do business. Now I want to engage your services. So don't ever be scared to ask for help because yep. if you don't ask, it's a no anyway. Yeah. And I think these times has for a lot of people humbled a lot of people mm. because it's it, because a lot of people are in positions where they didn't think that they were going to be in mm. uh, and with lockdowns and people being at home and um, and it also has and I've I've got I've got my podcast and and there's people that I'm sure that I may not have been able to get on a podcast <laughs> prior to COVID because so there's those opportunities that can come up uh, and again I think it's so important for us to be so flexible and and one thing that people often ask me as a as a speaker coach is they say to me where do I get these speaker events JJ how can I get a speaker event mm -hmm. and they often think that someone has to come to them for the opportunity mm -hmm. when I say to them why don't you create your own mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I've built my business on is creating your own opportunities. So creating, you know, if, 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 you, if you'll, you see an opportunity for a course, then you create it. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be very different from what you plan for the 12 months. And uh, it sounds like when you were planning your travel, it sounded like mine. I had my, <laughs> I've still got my, my whiteboard of my travel has been rubbed out that many times. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm a planner. So I'm planning everything. It's like, yep, yeah, it's all locked in. And then suddenly, shit, no. Okay, scrap that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's scrap that course. Let's do something else. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I say, it's like having a, rest, a restart button sometimes mm. um, and being a problem solver. It's like, okay, that didn't work. Press the restart button and let's do something different. Um, yeah, so people just on that point, it's a really good point. Um, sometimes this is the wake up to allow you to change direction. Like yeah. if you're not happy in your job, this might be the time to say, Hey, here it is. This is the opening for me to go in a different direction. You might yeah. be at the end of your bit. You're not passionate about your business anymore. It might be the time to, okay, this is a time for me to start something new because there is going to be a lot of opportunities out the back end of this as well. And a lot of industries are going to go through boom times and yeah. will continue to. So that might be your time to say, I'm going to change direction. Yeah. And, and I think for a lot of people, it's also a time to really understand what's important for you, to you. You know what's important in life and I know even spending time with my son and my husband has been so fantastic to spend that extra time together and to even think you know when there were lockdowns I didn't get my hair done for ages or I used to get my nails done I don't get my nails done anymore Craig. Like, like, do I really need to get my nails is it really that important you know and so for me it's been what's really important to me and what's not so important and it's the stuff that's not important to me you know it's the shopping and the it's it's just not important to me anymore yeah yeah no i agree 
Yeah. So, so what's the question that I haven't asked you yet that I should have asked? Um, oh, maybe you should have asked me about travel. Travel. Tell me about your travel. <laughs> uh, I've been to 120 different cities. I love to, I'm a foodie. So Am I? One of my favourite things to do, like if you say, I'm not into cars or anything, so I don't yeah. drive fancy cars, but I uh, love to go on food experiences that would people go, I'd never pay that for that experience, but I, yeah. I love to experience that type of thing. Yeah. Where's your favourite, one of your favourite places that you've travelled? Uh, oh, yeah. There's so many different places for so many different reasons, but I, I do love what Italy has to offer collectively. So if you want to grab a Tuscan villa, you could do that. If you want to go down to Capri and spend time in the water, you could do that. If you like history, hustle and bustle, you can do that. You know, I think yeah. uh, I've been to Italy maybe five or six times and I'll keep going back there if we can. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. All right, well, it's... Uh... And the other thing is, how can we get a copy of your book and get in contact with you? Yeah, on my website, you can grab a copy of my book. So um, just my personal name, craigschultz.com. Oh, yeah, craigschultz.com. Um, and you can buy the book on there. Um, it can be bought on Amazon for international people. In Australia, you could buy it um, just directly on the website as well. But I find shipping overseas hasn't been an easy scenario. So I think if you're an overseas guest, I've sold my book into about 15 different countries now. Um, they just buy it on Amazon. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. All right, well, we're now at the rapid question time, the fun questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. And I'm a bit I'm a bit scared because you've got some back back for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always a surprise for me too. <laughs> All right. So are you ready, Craig? I'm ready. Your favorite book, other than yours? Work Life Principles, Ray Dalio. Oh, I'll write that one down. Have you got a hidden talent? Hidden talent. Um I, uh, not, not a lot of people know that I was reasonably good at sport. Oh, cool. What peeves you off? Um, I think ignorant people. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> Who would play you in a movie? Probably Tom Cruise. Yeah, <laughs> Tom Cruise. <laughs> Uh, if you were asked to cook a dish, what would you cook and why? Uh, I like cooking sort of pastas of different sorts. So whether it's a chicken pesto pasta or a, a spaghetti bolognese, I like sort of staying in that lane way. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, one of your mentors? Uh, Jack DeLosa for the Entourage. I've done a lot of work of him over the last four years. Um, and Gerard Adams, he's sort of similar, but he's American-based. Yeah, awesome. What's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Uh, probably in the Philippines, eating local Filipino food. Um, so I actually don't even know what it was, but it wasn't <laughs> nice. <laughs> What's your favourite place? Oh, I said this. What's your favourite? What's another place that, that you travel that you love? Uh, I, I love the Greek islands. That yeah. was good. Yeah. Uh, New York. I like the hustle bustle and the foodie industry in New York too. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Played in a charity basketball game in the Philippines in front of uh, about 5,000 people in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I, I was interviewed on live TV, uh, MTV in Lebanon. That was pretty random. Oh, brilliant. And last question is, what is the legacy you want to leave? I think, you know, uh, I want people to look at me as somebody that's con contributed through just heart. You know, that's... Uh, you know, my story, I've got, you know, 50 testimonials of people that have read my book that write stuff that just gives me shivers. And I think, you know, if I can get that message out there and people just start with my book and then start following my content and education, I think, um, you know, people will say, look, you know, that's just tremendous heart. Brilliant. Love that. Yeah. All right. I'm ready for my 10 questions. Okay, because oh, I'm a foodie. 
I'm about to adjust my seat. Uh, so, there, there are some crossover ones here. Um, what is your favourite cuisine in food? Uh, Italian. Italian? I, to, I make a really mean gnocchi. You'd like to know, Craig? And what about <laughs> your favourite place to travel? Oh, and, and I'm the same. I love so many places, but I really loved, I really loved Paris. Okay. Yeah. What about a place you would live in the world other than in Australia? Ooh, uh, oh, I was going to say Paris again, but maybe New York for a little while. Not long term, but New York would be fun. Uh, what about the most bizarre experience you've ever had? Bizarre experience. Oh, that's a tough one. You said they were easy. <laughs> the bizarre, bizarre experience. I have to come back to it. That's a challenge. Right. What, what books impacted you the most in your life? Oh, uh, I love Tony Robbins' Awaken, uh, Awaken the Giant Within. Love, yeah. love that. If you could have dinner with anybody in the world, who would it be? Uh, my dad, he's passed away, but my dad. What's the number one bucket list item you would like to achieve before you die? I want to have lots of books out there helping people. So when I leave this planet, uh, people will be picking up my books and learning from them, even though I'm not here. What's the best bit of advice you've ever received? Um, from my dad, he said, there's no such word as can't. And what's the worst bit of advice you've ever received? Uh, you feel too much for people. <laughs> and uh, if you had to, the last question, if you had to inspire someone to maximise their one shot at life, what would you say to them? Invest in your mindset. There we go. Wow. I didn't miss one, but I still can't think of what I paid for that one. Thank you so much, Craig. It's been such a an honour interviewing you today and absolutely, absolutely loved your book. So thank you so much for sharing your story because I think it's it's really brave to do that. And I, I can just imagine, you know, you asked me a question about, you know, what, what I would love and I'd love, you know, to have lots of books out there and, leave my legacy and this is definitely your legacy and you know, the thing I love about books is that you can put them out there and you don't know who you've touched mm. <laughs> you don't know who you've helped yeah. uh, and I think you know your story is so unique because it's unique because I haven't heard any uh, father talk about this before uh, as you mentioned before and I think it was really good for me coming from a similar experience to actually hear uh, from a father's perspective what you went through. Um, and not only that story, but the empowerment around uh, what you did and what you've created and what you're continuing to create um, because of that experience. So thank you so much, Craig. Um, and those listening, I will put a link to the book uh, on down, downstairs, I was going to say, underneath uh, and you'll be able to get his book from there. And I would really encourage you to do that and get in contact with Craig because he's great to follow. Mm -hmm. I love how you're a straight shooter and um, I love some of your comments that you, you've got around the, about the world and about business. So thank you so much, Craig. Yeah. It's been lovely, a lovely to be on the show. <laughs> it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you. Thank you.